The Dark and Lonely Road, Author Unknown Every night we sit there in the comfort and safety of our own home, but we have no idea what is going on outside in the darkness. Not far from your home, there is a dark and lonely place. You may not know about it, but it's there. All over the country, in small towns and cities, there are so many of these dark and lonely places. When I was a young boy, I lived in a small town. Johnny Craig lived across the street from me. I was friends with his big brother. He was just a baby then. I saw him growing up, but I never paid too much attention to him. Sometimes, in the evening, my mother would send me out to the local store to buy a carton of milk or a bag of sugar. On the way to the shop, I had to pass a long, dark stretch of road. During the day, it was just a shady place lined with old, gnarled trees and vacant lots where nothing had been built and nothing was ever going to be built. I was never afraid of it by day, but at night it was a different place. A lonesome place. A place of darkness and strangeness. A place of terror and fear. There were no houses nearby, no street lights. It was pitch black. As black as black could be. Dark as the deepest night. Tall trees blocked out the moon and the stars, casting their long shadows across the road. Whenever you had to go that way, you walked slower and slower. It was like stepping into a dark tunnel. Behind you were the lights of the houses, the sound of cars and people walking along the sidewalk. Ahead of you, there was just a long, lonely stretch of darkness in which anything could be lurking, anything at all. Every time I had to pass that place at night, I would dread it. I kept hoping somebody would come along so I wouldn't have to walk alone, but nobody ever came. As I walked along that dark stretch of road, I would keep my eyes fixed on the trees, half expecting to see something or someone lurking there in the darkness. Perhaps it was the boogeyman. My mother had often told me about the boogeyman and how he waited in dark places for boys and girls who strayed from their path. Perhaps it was a child predator. My mother had also warned me about evil men who tried to lure children with the promise of candy and puppy dogs. Perhaps it was something else. Something much, much worse. Out of the corner of my eye, I would catch glimpses of mishappen figures crouching there in the pitch black, waiting for the moment when they would burst forth and pounce on me. Then, in that silent and isolated area, they would begin to do unspeakable things to me and nobody would ever see me again. I'm not sure what I expected to see lurking in that lonely place at night. My imagination always got the better of me. In my mind, it was a hideous creature, somewhere between animal and man. It had long, spiny limbs and huge, sharp claws. It had wet, slimy skin and eyes that burned like fire. I imagined it hiding in the branches of those old trees, dropping down without a sound and stalking the unwary boys and girls who passed along the dark and lonely road at night. One night, it almost got me. I was walking down the lonely road and all of a sudden there wasn't any light up ahead. That's when I knew it was coming. I could just feel it waiting in the darkness. I started running, desperate to get away, but I could feel it behind me. It was gaining on me. I could feel its breath on the back of my neck. So I ran. I ran as fast as I could. I've never ran that fast. I ran until I thought my heart would burst. It almost had me in its clutches, but I managed to get away. When I got back to the safety of my house, I looked at the mirror and there was a long, jagged rip in the back of my shirt, as if a sharp claw had tried to grab me and just missed. That scared me, real bad, and afterwards I hated going down that lonely road more than ever. Some night I won't come back, I had warned my mother. She just laughed and told me not to be silly. There's something out there in the dark, I told her. There's nothing there in the dark that isn't there at light, she assured me. What do adults know about the world? Grown-ups think they know everything. They place their trust in what they read, but they only read what is reported in newspapers and on TV. They drive around in their cars and never have to walk anywhere at night. They don't know what goes on in the dark, in the wretched, lonely places where no light ever shines and the darkness hangs like a cloud on the ground and no bird ever sings. I knew they wouldn't believe me. I knew there was nothing I could say to convince them that something or someone lived down there, among the trees, on that dark and lonely stretch of road. As I grew older, I gradually forgot about the lonely road. I got taller, I went to high school, I started playing football, and I learned to drive and started dating girls. Basically, I was growing up. The years passed by and somehow I forgot about the thing that lurked there in the darkness. The memory of it still remained in the distant corner of my mind, however but it was a memory locked away in childhood. The years passed by, but I never thought about the other kids who had to walk down the dark and lonely road at night. Three days ago, Johnny Craig went missing. 
the boy I mentioned earlier in the story. They found him in the trees on that dark and lonely stretch of road. His body was torn and ripped and crushed, almost beyond recognition. The police said he'd been mauled by some kind of animal. The moment I heard about it, I knew what happened. Johnny Craig had been murdered by the thing my childhood fears had created. The thing I had conjured up in my imagination. I had left it on that dark and lonely stretch of road. I had left it there to wait for some scared little boy who happened to be walking home one dark night. A little boy who couldn't run as fast as I could. After that, the town cut down the trees and put up street lights. That stretch of road isn't dark and lonely anymore. That thing lurked there is gone now. It's gone somewhere else, where the people are unsuspecting, to other small towns. A small town maybe like yours, where it will wait again, just as it did here. It will wait again for some frightened little kid to come along. It's only a matter of time. The Thing in the Cabin Author Unknown The old man was weak and sick. His body wouldn't last much longer. I made the old man get up and walk to the window. He looked out and saw them standing there in the snow. There were four hunters gathered outside the cabin. I saw them too, through his eyes. The hunters carried long guns and they were shivering with the cold. One of them walked up and banged on the door. Hello in there, he shouted. Hello, we're lost and we need a place to stay for the night. I pulled the old man away from the window and made him bar the door. We have a little money we can give you, the hunter shouted. We just need a warm place to spend the night, and a little food if you can spare it. We're freezing to death out here. I made the old man throw another log on the fire. You don't need to be scared of us, the hunter had said. We'll leave our guns outside. We don't mean you any harm. I made the old man pick up his rifle and aim it through a slit in the cabin door. Then I giggled as I made him pull the trigger. There was a loud bang and one of the hunters dropped in the snow. He didn't know what hit him. The others were taken off guard. They dragged their friend's body away and took cover behind the trees. Gunshots exploded, ripping through the wooden door and breaking some of the windows. I released my hold on the old man's brain and he collapsed in a heap on the floor. I flew up the chimney and soared above the cabin. The gunshots stopped and the hunters retreated. They would be back, though. I flew high above the treetops and followed them. When they stopped, I drifted down and landed in the branches of a tall tree. The hunters were below me. They were setting up camp and building a fire. There were three of them now, a fat one, a skinny one, and a bearded one. The dead one lay nearby, staining the snow red with his blood. I had no use for him. The bearded one chopped wood with his axe. He looked healthy and strong. The skinny one was struggling to light the fire, while the fat one just sat there and watched. I listened as the fat one spoke to the others. He told them they would camp there for the night, and in the morning... They would attack the cabin and kill the old man. I sat there in the branches of the tree and waited for night to come. When it was dark, the men curled up around the blazing fire and tried to get some sleep. I waited until they were lying still, then I dropped down silently into the snow. I crept towards the fat man who was wrapped up in his fur coat, snoring peacefully. Slowly, I reached out and took hold of the fat man's mind. I made him get up and walk over to where the dead man lay in the snow. I made him kneel down beside the corpse and take out his hunting knife. Then I made him saw through the neck of his dead friend. When he was done, I made him smear his face with blood. Then I made him pick up the severed head and carry it back to the fire. I released my hold on the fat man's mind and that's where I left him, standing in front of the fire, smeared with blood and holding the dead man's severed head. When he looked down and saw the head, he screamed and woke the others. They scrambled to their feet and stared in horror at the severed head the fat man was clutching. I watched it all from the safety of the trees. There were shouts and more screams as the skinny one and the bearded one grabbed their guns and blasted the fat man until he lay in a bloody heap on the snow. Now there were only two men. They sat by the fire and waited. I watched and waited too. They were waiting for dawn to arrive. Then they would attack the cabin and kill the old man. The bearded one threw more wood on the fire. He was too scared to sleep. The skinny one was weaker. He lay down and closed his eyes. I took my chance, creeping up to the skinny one and reaching into his mind. I made him take out his hunting knife. I made him slowly get to his feet. The bearded one stared at us, wondering what was going on. I made the skinny one leap across the flames and attack the bearded one. The skinny one was weak and the bearded one was too strong for him. I knew he would lose the fight. I released his mind and flew into the trees to watch from a safe distance. 
There was a fierce struggle, but in the end, the bearded one prevailed. He plunged the hunting knife into his friend's chest and left the skinny one to bleed out in the snow. Now there was only one. I flew back to the cabin and slipped down the chimney. The old man lay on the floor where I left him. I took hold of his mind again and we searched through the cabin. There was not much in that place that I could use. In a rusty metal box, I found a pair of garden shears. The handles were rusty, but the blades were still sharp. I made the old man pick them up. I made him look out the window and through his eyes, I saw the bearded one coming across the snow. His gun pulled. Come out, old man, the bearded one cried. Come out or I'll kill you. He fired his gun and a bullet ripped through the cabin door. I made the old man shout, Okay, I'm coming out. I made him open the garden shears and place the blades at either side of his neck. Then I made him throw open the door and walk out into the sunlight. When the bearded one saw him, he stopped in his tracks and raised his gun. What are you up to, old man? He demanded. The old man didn't say a word. I wouldn't let him. The bearded man cautiously approached. Why did you have to start shooting at us? He asked. We didn't mean you any harm. We just needed a place to stay. The old man resisted me and for a moment I lost control. A thin wail escaped his lips. Help me! He begged. I regained control of his mind, and summoning all the strength he had in his withered arms, I made him slam the handles of the shears together. The blades snapped together, slicing off his head. It fell to the ground with a thud, then his body crumbled and collapsed in a bloody heap. My grip on his mind was broken and I floated upwards. The bearded one was so shocked and stunned that all he could do was stare in horror at the terrible sight. I took advantage of his momentary weakness dropping into his shoulders and reaching into his brain to take charge. Now he was mine. After we dragged the bodies into the cabin, we feasted on the remains until I was satisfied. I made the bearded man throw another log on the fire and we sat in the rocking chair. Together we rocked back and forth, enjoying the heat from the roaring flames. The bearded man was strong and healthy. His body would last a long time.